Hi, this is Anne from Moti Alelo. In this episode of the Moti Alelo podcast series, we'll be discussing two recent research articles about the language learning app Duolingo. Our guest today is Dr. Dustin Crowther. He's an assistant professor of second language studies at University of Hawaii at Manoa. His areas of expertise include second language speech production and perception, global Englishes, and methodological practices in second language acquisition research. He serves as a TESOL quarterly editor for research dissemination and is also an advisor for the Multi Alilu Initiative. Today, we're very honored to have Dr. Crowther come in to discuss two of his recent co authored papers on the mobile assisted language learning app Duolingo. Hello, Dr. Crowther. Hello, thank you for having me. So I came across your studies about Duolingo and I think that's very interesting because I read that um, you and your colleagues were actually the participants in this study as well. Can you tell us a little bit about these studies? Sure, I can give you a little bit of framing about uh, the study published in Recall, a working paper study, as well as a third study that I wasn't part of the writing process, but came out of a larger uh, project. So you mentioned that in, uh, especially the Recall study that uh, your audience can see on the form on the screen, uh, it came out of a class project. So we, there were nine of us in total, plus our uh, professor. And basically, we served as researchers as participants, where we were investigating our own learning through the use of Duolingo. Uh, We studied Turkish during the study. Uh, I mentioned uh, that there were a few different publications tied to this project. Uh, We have a publication in Recall. Uh, My colleagues who work in the project have a publication in the Journal Languages, which took a more narrative perspective on the use of Duolingo. And then there is a working paper that I put together with uh, Dr. Kathy Kim and Dr. Sean Lowen, uh, in which we were sort of looking at the technological side of Duolingo and to what extent the pedagogical approaches were informed by what we know from instructed second language acquisition research. So while the three papers are distinct papers, there is definite overlap between the three of them. So what's in one paper will most definitely inform what are in the other two papers as well. And at the center of these papers is the fact that we were the participants learning through the use of Duolingo. I see, that sounds very interesting. It feels like um, as teachers, we can try try that out with our students as well. Um, So what were the key takeaways from these studies? Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure, so uh, since the study in Recall, the study titled Mobile Assisted Language Learning, a Duolingo Case Study, was the empirical study that we conducted. I can talk about the takeaways there. What we did in that study was we wanted to follow up on the Duolingo claim of 34 hours potentially being equivalent to uh, a semester of university study. So we all decided to choose a language in which none of the participants had familiarity with. Uh, So we chose Turkish. There was no one in the class who had previously studied Turkish or had any knowledge of Turkish. And we all endeavored to use Duolingo for 34 hours and see to what extent we could develop our abilities. Uh, In order to test this, uh, a colleague of ours who was teaching first year Turkish at our university Uh, actually developed a Turkish 101, I think Turkish 151 test is what we refer to it in the study, uh, to test uh, our knowledge. And that test took into account what would generally be taught in a first semester Turkish course, as well as a certain cutoff point on the Duolingo tree. So for those not familiar in Duolingo, you typically move down a topic tree as you learn different grammatical and lexical and even phonological considerations in the language. So what we found in performing the study was, A, we all definitely learned Turkish. We knew more Turkish than when we began. And I remember we wrote this in the paper, and while it seems sort of silly to make that claim because you would expect that, it is important that we can document the fact that language learning does occur through the use of the app. One of the concerns is that For most of us, when we completed the study, we, I think only three of us actually, I say three of us, because 
I shouldn't because I was not one of the us in the three, but only three members of the team actually scored high enough on the 151 test to pass the course itself. So our test scores weren't, uh, our test scores through Duolingo Learning weren't aligned with what would be expected of a first year university learner of Turkish based on that specific program at the university that we were at. One of the interpretations we had is that, and this is something that gets discussed in the working paper that's referenced as well, is that for the most part, the activities within Duolingo are really sort of promoting more, I would say, explicit knowledge, right? A recognizing grammatical rules, looking at word order, memorizing of vocabulary. So when we're being tested, right? It's like we more testing our explicit knowledge. And one of the considerations is to what extent in spontaneous communication can we draw upon that knowledge uh, as opposed to what is sort of more automatically available to us. But what is sort of automatically available to us isn't something that Duolingo is focusing on. However, in commutative-based classrooms that we're seeing more and more, uh, especially in North America, for the way that languages are being addressed, you're going to have more of a focus on that sort of spontaneous usage of the language or use of the language within more communicative uh, activities. So there is a disconnect a little bit from our experiences between how well you know, we actually did for Turkish 101 based on 34 hours. That, that means that the 34 hour study that was originally published, a white paper for Duolingo, focused on a test that focused on this explicit knowledge. So therefore you would expect uh, relatively solid gains in that way. If you focus on sort of these explicit activities promoting explicit knowledge development when you're learning, then a test that is testing that knowledge is going to help in that way. The test we took uh, had questions in that that sort of drew upon both our explicit and our implicit abilities with the language itself. Awesome. So, so oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I just in one of the papers in Crowther at all the uh, working papers, you and your colleagues drew on um, two frameworks. One is the call framework and the other is the mall framework. And I was wondering if you could tell us why were these frameworks chosen and what are they about? Sure. The, so yeah, in, so the paper that I wrote and was published as a working paper uh, in the Michigan State University Second Language Studies uh, program, uh, developed with Kathy Kim, who's now at Boston University, and Sean Lowen, who was overseeing the project. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is, at the time that we developed this project, right, mobile assisted language learning was, was really starting to take off. And we can even say between now 2020 and 2017, which means this project would have been probably 2016 that we were doing data, is already been four years. So, so a lot has occurred in research since that time. So I just want to sort of frame it within that, that timeline of when the study was conducted. At the time, uh, Reinders and Pegram had a framework for MAL that was focusing very much on the affordances of mobile assisted language learning. So what is it that being able to study a language, for example, using our smartphones, allowed us to do that we couldn't do in the classroom, right? And of course, some of those affordances are, you know, you can access uh, language learning materials basically any place, any time. So if you look at the recall study, like there's examples of those of us standing in line at a Starbucks using Duolingo. One of our colleagues was on a trip to Africa in the back of a Jeep doing Duolingo in the back of a Jeep in the middle of Africa somewhere. She might've been on safari. I can't remember at this point. So you right? can basically learn languages anywhere then. Yeah, right. So it's, it's really looking at these affordances, right? Other affordances, uh, anytime, any place, but now you can go online. So I don't know what a word means. Well, we have access to the internet. We can go and look it up. Something cultural comes up, right? So, this is just really, really base level of these affordances. But what the Reinders and Pegram framework didn't do, at least in our opinion, was really look at the language learning process itself. It made reference to input and a few other key uh, constructs in second language acquisition, but it was more focused on, on sort of assessing to what extent the program took advantages of the affordances of MAL. We were interested 
from an ISLA perspective, right, where we're looking at the systematic manipulation uh, of the mechanisms of learning. Because a program like Duolingo or other programs, Babel, Busu, uh, Rosetta Stone, right, in essence, they're making pedagogical decisions to promote our learning. So we are curious to what extent Duolingo was actually drawing upon what we know about the language learning process in making decisions. So Carol Chappelle had a framework that was used for computer assisted language learning. Uh, and while MAL in some, in some writing has been promoted as an extension to call, MAL has been promoted as part of call. I would argue MAL is something different given the affordances uh, however, the call framework still gave us a shape that didn't exist in other framework for analyzing it, right? So this is a case where I would say, I don't know if I would say we used Chappelle's framework as much as we adapted Chappelle's framework to analyze to what extent Duolingo was making use of what we know from an instructed second language acquisition uh, perspective. I see, awesome, thank you so much. I think this is gonna be my last question and which is very important, what are some of the implications for program development, whether for language learning app development or for when integrating like a language learning app into a foreign, into foreign language yeah. instruction? Yeah, and I think the main point, this is actually something I was gonna mention a, a few moments ago, is uh, programs like Duolingo and I mentioned Babel, Busu, Rosetta Stone, uh, I know there's a few others, they provide these opportunities to, you know, gain quick, in the case of Duolingo, free access to language learning materials. Uh, I think what's important to recognize is that second language acquisition is a, a much larger process that requires, you know, not just studying of the language through the mobile app, but providing yourself opportunities to go out and use the language as a means to, uh, whether you're trying to solidify knowledge you have, whether you're trying to proceduralize knowledge you have, whether you're trying to, you know, allow your innate abilities to acquire language to work, coming from these different, these different theories and these different perspectives on language acquisition, right? Providing opportunities and recognizing that, you know, these, these tools are great support tools for the process of language acquisition. Uh, they shouldn't be. And uh, I know, uh, Louis von Ahn, I don't know if I said the name right, he talked about this a little bit when he was talking about Duolingo and right that they're not intended to be the be all and end all to learning a language. So to me, I think what's important to note is how do you supplement uh, the study on an app like Duolingo with the other components of language acquisition that we know play an important role in developing your ability to use the language, specifically the ability to use the language during uh, spontaneous communication. Yeah, that is the hardest part of language learning, in my opinion. To yes. use something spontaneously, the interaction. Yes. Um, right. Any other things you would like to say before we close our interview? I think I would definitely say uh, looking at the area of mobile assisted language learning in general, and especially at these industry-based apps is we are seeing a really promising trend where, for example, Duolingo began very much, uh, you know, drawing upon the knowledge of uh, computer programmers in that. And now we're starting to see them hiring more and more uh, from those with backgrounds in second language assessment, second language, uh, sorry, second, those backgrounds in second language acquisition and those in backgrounds in second language testing and assessment. Right, so I think there's expectations at this point that we're simply, we're gonna keep seeing these apps that are available continue to evolve and improve and provide us with more and more options. And I think the challenge that we're gonna start seeing is uh, how can teachers make use of these apps as part of their larger curriculums, whether you're bringing them into K to 12 contexts, using them uh, in foreign language classrooms here in the United States or using them in uh, English as a foreign language context like Japan, China, Korea, other parts of the world. And then how do we determine how they can use them in those contexts? And then how do we convey this knowledge to them as well? Which I think very much falls in line with the goals of Multialelo in creating this dialogue between researchers and teachers in such a way that 
uh, allows for this sort of harmonious uh, communication between these different areas that are all important in this process of second language acquisition. Yeah, it's so exciting to see where technology, as it keeps on advancing, what kind of new algorithms will be available to help support better support the language learning process. That's very exciting. And um, lastly, I just want to maybe advertise Dr. Crowther's website here. If you have any questions, you can check out his um, many, many, many studies published in recent years. And also some wonderful scenic pictures of uh, Vancouver, Canada that you're welcome to look at as well on my webpage. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much for um, giving your time to us today to tell us about Duolingo and your paper uh, research process. Thank you so much, Dr. Crawford. Thank you for having me. Thank you.